Mike Gaben here with a KSP tutorial. I'm in the VAB with a simple rocket, really simple. It's just four parts, and we're going to be taking it into space. But first, let's take a quick look at it. Starting off, I have a Mark 1 command pod topped off with a Mark 16 parachute because I do want to get our brave Kerbal back down safely. Under the command pod, I have a TR-18A stack decoupler, which I'll use to detach the booster once it's spent. Speaking of which, the final part is a BACC Thumper solid fuel booster, which will certainly provide this vehicle with a significant amount of up. So without any further delay, let's light this candle. And we're away. Of course, all I did there was hit the space bar to ignite the engine. And all I want to do here is go straight up. My only goal is to get into space. I want to get there in as direct a route as possible. So nothing fancy, just straight up. And oh, you can see we are picking up speed quickly here. In fact, our G meter is getting dangerously high, close to the red. You should note I have no throttle control. I can't control the throttle at all, nor turn off the engine, because this is a solid rocket. Oh, no! Oh, dear. Ooh, poor Jeb. Well, that didn't go so well. Oh, well, what we'll do is we will revert back to vehicle assembly and try and sort things out there. Now, I'm not going to change the design of this rocket at all. Instead, I'm going to right-click on my booster, which brings up this menu that allows me to tweak some of the properties of this part. There are two things I can adjust, the thrust limiter and the amount of fuel. I'm going to adjust the thrust limiter to 37% and take out about a quarter of the fuel. And with that done, I'm going to give this thing another go. Oh, look at that. Though certainly not as dramatic, this is a much saner ride for our poor pilot. So let's talk about what happened before. Quite simply, we were going too fast for being so low in the atmosphere. As you move through the atmosphere, you compress the air in front of you, and this produces resistance to your motion, but it can also produce a heck of a lot of heat. And this is called shock heating. We simply had too much of it, which caused our vessel to explode. Now we are accelerating at a much lower rate, putting our pilot in far less danger than we did before. By the way, for those who may be following my Let's Play, uh, don't worry. I have no plans of abandoning it, and I'll be continuing on with the adventures of Svetlana and Rob Art and the rest of the company. However, with the transition that's going on right now between 1.05 and 1.1, uh, that build that I had my 1.05 build with all the mods was starting to get some major hiccups. So I made the decision to put it on hold until 1.1 comes out in full release and all the modders have had a chance to push out updates which hopefully should make the whole thing a lot more stable. Meanwhile, I am just about out of correction. I am out of fuel. So press M to go into map view to check my apoapsis which is about 86.5 kilometers well above the 70 kilometer altitude that marks the upper reach of the atmosphere. Nice. We are going to space. So let's uh, lock the vessel on the prograde vector. Keep us moving through the airstream pointing forward. Let's take a closer look at our trajectory. Note that although we are certainly on our way up and out of the atmosphere, our time in space is going to be pretty brief. We will soon be on our way back down because, of course, we're falling. So the question is, how do we prevent ourselves from falling so that we can stay in space? This is a question that the vast majority of space films, games, and television programs just completely avoid dealing with. But if you want to get good at Kerbal Space Program, this is a question that you've got to get an answer to. So here's the answer. You can't. You can't escape gravity. Even if you get far enough away from Kerbin to escape its gravity, You'll just fall under the influence of another gravitational field of some other body and begin falling towards that. So if you never stop falling, how do you stay in space? That's going to be the topic for the next video, but the short answer is it's all about speed, specifically horizontal speed. You'll never stop falling, but if you can move fast enough, you just might keep missing the ground. And speaking of hitting the ground, that is what we are going to be doing very very shortly so let's prepare for that so 
I'm gonna ditch our booster, which is nothing but dead weight. There we go. I like to turn myself towards one of the normal vectors, so I'm moving tr perpendicularly to my trajectory. That way there's no chance for me to hit that thing. It's now out of my path. And I'm going to orient myself towards the surface retrograde vector so that we can uh, move through the atmosphere in as safe a way as we can. We certainly want to protect our parachute at the top from any shock heating that we may encounter on the way down. Let's speed up the playback here. This is going to get pretty mundane. The one thing I will mention, though, is to keep an eye on that parachute icon in the bottom left. It goes from orange into red. That's telling you that it is not safe to deploy your parachute, so do not do so. Instead, wait for those colors to go away, and that will tell you when it's safe to deploy that parachute. There we go. And now our parachute is nice and fully deployed, giving Jeb a nice soft landing on the surface. Back in the VAB, I adjusted the thrust to 37%, which seems like an oddly specific number. Well, it was, because I worked out previously what would be a good number to set my thrust at. So let me show you how to calculate that yourself. But first, we need to look at thrust a little more closely. Let's freeze this image and zoom in closer on the business end of this rocket. Right now our rocket is busy burning fuel. Well, exploding may be a more accurate term, and the gases that result from that explosion want to expand very quickly. However, they are giving nowhere to go other than out the nozzle at the bottom. This results in the gases leaving the nozzle at a very high velocity. The engine is exerting a great deal of force on these gases and, according to Newton's third law, every force is accompanied by an equal and opposite force. And it is this reaction force on the rocket that propels it forward. We call this force thrust. Now there are other forces acting on this rocket right now, but the one additional force I want to concentrate on here is the force of gravity, which is trying to pull the rocket back down towards Kerbin's surface. We call this force weight. If we divide the thrust by the weight, we get a very useful number for us called the thrust to weight ratio, or TWR. Put simply, if the TWR is greater than one, rocket go up, less than one, rocket not go up. With that, let's go into the VAB and work out some thrust to weight ratios. We need to differentiate between weight and mass. As mentioned, weight is the force of gravity on an object while mass is something different. For our purposes, we'll define mass as simply the amount of stuff, you know, atoms and whatnot, that make up the object. In our everyday lives, we tend to use the words weight and mass interchangeably, and this is completely okay, because as long as we remain on the surface of the Earth, weight and mass are directly related. Something with twice the mass will just have twice the weight. But mass is not the only thing weight depends on. Weight is also directly related to the gravitational field strength. Twice the strength of the gravitational field, twice the weight of an object of a given mass. This gives us a formula. Weight, or the force of gravity, so we'll represent it with an Fg, equals mass times the gravitational field strength, which we'll represent with a g. On the surface of Kerbin, g is about the same as it is on the surface of the Earth, 9.8 newtons per kilogram, or using the units that are more commonly used in KSP, 9.8 kilonewtons per metric ton. In order to calculate the weight of our rocket, all we need is the total mass, which is handily available with the engineering stats here at the bottom right. It's 8.6 tons. And I should mention that this is the rocket before I did any tweaking to the booster. So, doing the math, Force of gravity is equal to 8.6 times 9.8, which gets us 84.28 kilonewton. Next, we need to thrust. That is even easier. Right-clicking on the booster in the inventory, we see two thrusts, ASL 250 kilonewtons and VAC 300 kilonewtons. The first is the thrust on the surface of Kerbin. The second is the thrust in the vacuum of space. Let's work out our thrust to weight ratio at takeoff. So, TWR equals 250, divided by 84.28, which gets us 2.97. 
That's quite the kick in the pants for Jeb. For comparison, the Soyuz, which is our current vehicle for bringing people into space, has a launch thrust to weight ratio of about 1.3. But it gets worse. Let's work out what the TWR would be right when the fuel runs out. My first launch never got to this point, but this will give us a very good idea as to what the problem was. By this point, we would have been high enough in the atmosphere that the thrust would have been far closer to the 300 kilonewtons rather than the 250 kilonewtons. So we'll use that number. But more significantly, we would have lost the mass of all of that fuel. The part information gives us the mass, gives us the mass of the fuel at 6.1 tons. So our new vehicle mass would be 8.6 minus 6.15 or 2.45 tons. Now technically, being off the surface would result in the gravitational field strength going down, but, and for now you'll just have to trust me on this one, it doesn't go down enough for us to worry about. I'll make this a topic in a future episode. Anyway, this gives us a new TWR of 12.5. Clearly this was enough to blow up our rocket before we even got to this point, but to give this number some perspective, if we ignore air resistance, gives, this gives us the acceleration of our spacecraft which is also the force our pilot feels. 1G is what all of us feel almost all the time. A sustained force of 2Gs means you are twice as heavy. And that's all of you, like your heart, your brain, your bones, your eyes, everything. A trained fit pilot in a G suit can sustain about 9Gs before they are likely to lose consciousness. Beyond that, we're looking at possible death. Now, KSP doesn't model that effect on our pilot, but nonetheless, let's get this under some control and go to the tweaked version of my rocket. After taking out about a quarter of the fuel, the mass at launch was 6.8 tons. In addition, I reduced the thrust to only 37% of its max thrust. That gives us a launch thrust of 92.5 kilonewtons, and this gives us a launch thrust to weight ratio only 1.39. Now that's more like it. Let's take a look at the TWR at main engine cutoff. Here, instead of 12.5, my TWR goes down to 4.6. To put that into perspective, it isn't unusual for roller coasters to max out around 5 Gs, though for much shorter periods of time than our pilot would have had to endure. Still, especially for KSP, well within our tolerances. So to summarize, managing the thrust to weight ratios of your rockets makes them easier to control and less likely to explode. And don't forget to check the max TWR that you will be getting as the fuel runs out. This will end it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and that you will be back again next time.